My German Heroes, then. Or maybe the title should be really more along the lines of Germans that are more or less well known that have had an influence on me or have made an impression on me. But as you can see, that's not quite the snappy title that German Heroes is. My German Heroes. But anyway, here are my German Heroes. German Heroes. You might be surprised by some of these. Now obviously if I was trying to be all cool, um, I'd make this list all highbrow and name names like Schiller, Kant, Nietzsche, Brecht, Einstein, Brahms, Beethoven, maybe some people from cinema like Wim Wenders or, or, oder, or Werner Herzog. Talking of cinema, what do you think about this new format for YouTube? I think this looks great, I think this is the ideal format for YouTube. You seem sceptical. Okay, maybe it's lacking something because this is probably a lot better. This probably functions a lot better with a non-stabilized smartphone outside. Maybe that's a problem. But as I say, if I was trying to be cool, I'd make this all highbrow and name all these really impressive names from classic literature and classical composers and whatever. But um, you know me, I'm more into my pop culture. I not I'm not the type of person that knocks off work and uh, then picks up War and Peace or you know, something really heavy. I studied at university, had to go through some pretty um, heavy literature and stuff like that at university so I you know I use my free time to just have a good time and I'm into sport, I'm into pop music, I'm into what am I into? TV, cinema, mainstream cinema, you know everyday normal stuff and uh, my first hero is actually going to be from the world of sport and this is going to actually take some explaining. If you're really heavily into sports yourself then maybe not but if you just know this person more as a kind of third-rate TV personality then hmm okay. It's uh, Boris Becker. Bear with me guys, bear with me guys. In Germany I know G Boris Becker has a certain reputation. First of all not being the brightest candle on the cake shall we say not really being very good in his own native language he's also obviously this is something that's built up over the years as well he's um, had lots of problems with problems with money shall we say uh, convicted tax evader ended up practically uh, bankrupt despite having earned millions and millions also his extramarital affairs, having married a wonderfully beautiful intelligent woman, Barbara. Uh, given She'd given birth to his two sons, two beautiful sons, and then seemingly just on a permanent mission to have as many affairs as possible with the same, exact same Beuteschema, trying to find uh, Beuteschema. A uh, great German word, isn't it? It's uh, Beute is actually prey, so like a, an animal, a bird of prey or an animal that, that hunts would have Beute, that's a, a prey, and Shima is like pattern or scheme or whatever, so he's his type, looking for exactly the same type of woman again, slim, mixed race, attractive women. But anyway, his uh, permanent uh, mission to have as many affairs as possible and all with exactly the same type. Yeah, but thankfully this is not about Boris Becker's personal life. This is, a, and it's also, I have to say, something that we, this whole image of Boris Becker is something that we didn't get in the UK. And of course this is more about my German heroes as an English person. And also this is um, one of the first prominent German personalities that I um, really admired whilst I was still young and living in England. He did, of course, I mean, his sporting achievements are incredible and... He was well known, of course, for winning Wimbledon at the age of 17 in 1985, coming back as an 18-year-old to defend his title, probably topping his achievements in the first year by actually beating a real top name, Ivan Lendl, in the final. So, yeah, and he also obviously went on to win Wimbledon one more time. Wasn't just um, a, a winner on grass. He wasn't a, a superstar on clay. He didn't win any tournaments on clay but he did win on hard courts, winning in the USA, I believe. Yeah, he won the US Open, he won the Australian Open and a whole series of Masters titles and the WCT finals, things like that. His sporting achievements really are brilliant. He achieved a lot and it wasn't so much his 
sporting achievements that struck me at the time it was his his way of when it was that I remember I in 1985 I was 12 years old and you've got to bear in mind that in the UK people unless you are specifically into tennis yourself we really only pay attention to only take notice of Wimbledon Wimbledon is watched every year by millions of people on TV and even casual fans go down to Wimbledon for a day out and a traditional day out with strawberries and cream just to have the experience. It's a quintessential English experience. You don't have to be a big tennis fan to watch Wimbledon and in fact the typical sports fan would watch Wimbledon, the Wimbledon finals and not pay attention to any tennis at all around the year and that was certainly my case. I was into sport but I've always been more into football or cricket and at a time I was just a casual observer of tennis and then this 17 year old guy burst on the scene and the way he stormed to the final in 1985 it wasn't so much what he achieved but how he achieved it obviously he was young and impulsive and he was doing crazy stuff I remember those rallies where he would be at the net and he'd dive he'd throw himself on the on the floor just to catch this one last volley things that probably I mean he cut them out of his game as he as he progressed and got older obviously but things that you probably wouldn't teach you certainly wouldn't coach just instinctive things and of course the massive serve boom boom Becker it was even a massive serve ideal for grass it was just so exciting the way he did it and obviously just the, the idea of this 17 year old kid from supposedly nowhere I mean people who had been watching the youth tournaments beforehand had seen him coming and also he won the Queen's tournament which is a traditional warm-up for Wimbledon before a couple of weeks before the tournament starts so people did have him on their radar and to get back to the idea of um, Boris Becker uh, he's, he's more his character as a as a personality, his personal life and stuff, we were very much shielded from that in the UK in that he would do these interviews as a 17 year old lad in English and we'd come across as rather eloquent and we obviously were more forgiving because he was speaking a foreign language and was great seeing this sportsman being able to express himself at such a young age in English and also if you follow him on English TV, he's done quite a lot of uh, presenting as a presenter for the BBC at Wimbledon typically as an expert and consult with him he still comes across in English as rather eloquent and some somehow he's it's more forgiving obviously because it's not his own language but he seems to do better in English than he does in German but anyway back then me as a 12 year old lad it really got me into tennis and uh, it really is down to Boris Becker I'd been watching Wimbledon watching the final the final weekend for years and years and years but nobody had ever really inspired me to pick up a racket but that summer after that I was straight down to the local club um, joined up and was playing tennis regularly for a few years then I mean, never really developed into a major tennis player or or a tennis fan but I did take an interest more in tennis and it was, as I say, we're very, very blinkered in the UK. We watched Wimbledon and we're not really interested in anything else. But it, it actually got me. I think he, he did a lot for the popularity of sport. And certainly in Germany, I think he boosted the profile of tennis. Um, certainly during the period where you had uh, Steffi Graf and Boris Becker winning tournaments together. Um, the profile of tennis in Germany was really raised. But... Um, it certainly goes for England too. He was a, a big star in the UK and he inspired me to take up a sport I'd never never played and also watch more sport, watch the French Open, watch um, Australian Open and really be more aware of the sport itself. So yeah, whatever you want to say about Boris Becker, he was a very big influence on the 12 year old me and got me interested in, so in a whole new sport and playing tennis regularly. This next one is not from the world of sport, we're into the world of entertainment and more specifically into comedy comedy and music, but the point here is mostly comedy. We are talking, of course, about Helga Schneider. I know, I know, I know, I know, it's very much, much Geschmackssache, a matter of taste, and Helga Schneider is quite obviously not everybody's cup of tea. He has a very peculiar um, style of humour. Um, nothing very sophisticated about it, to be honest. Um, for people who don't know, know Helga Schneider, he is actually first and foremost a, a jazz musician. He's a, a qualified, he studied music 
and he's a very very competent multi-instrumentalist musician jazz musician he is very passionate about jazz and I think he initially would have loved a career basically in jazz music but there's something very naturally funny about him as I say his humor is not particularly sophisticated it's a lot of slapstick or just complete nonsense he goes off on monologues that are just bizarre in their imagery and just silly quite a lot of playground humor but um, for me he will always be a very important figure and again I'm very much wanting you to understand this from the British, the English, UK. God, I get so many complaints about which terms I use. If I if I say English, I get people complaining that I don't include the rest of the UK or the rest of Britain. If I say British, I get Scottish people always complaining, complaining that the concept of Britain is uh, an English nationalist uh, concept, and it is. I understand, but at the moment there is a state. At the moment, it's going to crumble and fall apart. But anyway, there's a state that's called the UK. I am from there, that's what's in my passport, it also says something about British, but I am from England, so sorry. <sighs> We're talking about Helga Schneider and I'm here qualifying, uh, justifying why I say British is English. But anyway, I'm English and this is my English point of view about German humour. Bear in mind, we have, probably like uh, the rest of the world in general, to be honest, we have this stereotype about Germany that the Germans don't really have a sense of humour. Germans are well known for their efficiency, for being serious, for being successful, confident, maybe a little bit arrogant. And humour really doesn't fit, fit into that image, doesn't, you know, go along with the cliches that we know. And we have a saying in, in England, German humour, it's no laughing matter. Deutscher Humor ist einfach nicht zum Lachen. And I have to admit that when I first came over to Germany when I was a student, I came over to Germany in 1994 and I was, you know, subject to a lot of these prejudices and I didn't really come here expecting to find comedy. I didn't really come here expecting to find good pop music or whatever. So, you know, I had my prejudices even though I was very, very interested in Germany and in general very open. And when I came over, it was the year of the massive uh, single release um, on Helga Schneider's Katzeklaw. And I absolutely hated it. I, ich konnte damit gar nichts anfangen. It didn't mean anything to me. It wasn't funny. It was just this... It, obviously, it wasn't a, the full picture of Helga Schneider. I knew nothing about Helga Schneider. And it was just this very odd, supposedly comedy single record that just wasn't funny it seemed clumsy uh, just this guy talking about his cat litter and if you want to have a clean cat buy some cat litter so it went a long way to confirming stereotypes that german humor was not sophisticated but obviously it was a, it was a mainstream thing how many things that are that are kind of it, you'd, it would be a viral hit nowadays wouldn't it it would be on youtube and it would be a viral hit with with millions of views but back then it was singles that got in the charts that was the equivalent of the viral video today so in that year it wasn't really when i got into helga schneider or any german comedy to be honest but um before i left a friend of mine did me a compilation tape you remember uh, cassettes those little tapes that people used to do for you he did me a Probably he probably caught on to this idea that we had this um, prejudice that Germans aren't funny and that have no comedy. And he made me a cassette, and on it were a lot of sketches from lots of the comedy records, um, comedy sketches that Helga Schneider had done over the years, and also some stuff from L'Oreal. Uh, looking back, L'Oreal is probably the more important um, personality in the history of German humour and very, very sophisticated humour in, in, in parts, very clever wordplay, etc, etc. But anyway, it was really Helga Schneider that struck me. Um, I was just struck by his particular form of comedy, the, the bizarre, the surreal, the, the downright silly. And it was probably that moment where it clicked with me and I realised that Germany had some, if not probably my favourite comedians. I've gone on about this in other videos. I think there is a... I mean, true to the stereotype, um, when it comes to German humour, I think some of the best quality is actually the political cabaret that isn't necessarily funny. It's clever and it's humorous, but it's not belly laughs type stuff. I've talked about um, Hagen Ritter, been to see him, I enjoy his, his stuff very much. 
Um, but there's, there's a rich tradition that's very in, um, worth exploring of a political cabaret. But um, Helga Schneider will always be my favourite, and Helga Schneider will always be the man that turned me on to German comedy. Without getting too highbrow, I did want to include some kind of literature in this list and some kind of author, but reflecting on it, there was nobody... I'm not a pro prolific reader, I have to admit. Um, because of the nature of my job, my day job, I am reading and writing the whole day long, really, from like eight to ten hours a day, just reading and translating. So when I get off work, it's not the kind of thing I want to do to relax. Whilst I was working in an office, for example, years ago, I would read a lot on public transport. I caught the train or the tram to work, I would read a lot on the way to work. But now I relax by doing other things. And there is not really a German author where I say, oh, I really love reading his stuff. And I do tend to read more in English, to be honest. I could name a few authors if you ask me who are your favourite English language authors. I'd probably come up with some names, but in German that's not the case. Who had an influence on me and who do I appreciate? I would probably name Heinrich Böll because um, Die verlorene Ehre der Katharina Blum was uh, one of the books we had to study at A-level and at the time obviously it was just a it was just work, it was schoolwork, it was not interesting, it was... The subject itself was maybe interesting, but you know, when you're doing your A-levels, you don't really get into the literature you have to study, it's more of a chore. But with hindsight, it's something that went on to interest me quite a lot. I've not got into um, Heinrich Böll in any, any real way, I haven't gone on to read any more of his books, but with hindsight, I look back and think, yes, that was an interesting subject. The whole idea of the um, zeitgeist, the spirit of the times back then, this uh, paranoia about the Bader Meinhof uh, terrorists and the idea of the Springer press, the uh, tabloid press, how they ruined the honour of this woman, how it was all turned in, um, interwoven. It's a very interesting subject. And it also went on to get me interested into Bader Meinhof. Um, stuff like that got me reading Stefan Aust's uh, book about the the terrorist group, for instance. But, um, so I would mention that, but when it comes to literature, thinking about it, the German authors that have had most influence on me, certainly most influence on any child that has grown up in the UK, that has to be the Brothers Grimm, surely. Now this subject is a massive subject. I tried to do some research, research and I ended up printing out all these things and there's just far too much. It's probably a whole subject for a whole video itself. Um, but I just was reflecting on how much a part of every child's childhood it is in the UK. These two weird German authors born at the late end, 1785 and 1786 I think, in Hanau, incidentally, here in Germany, they wrote their first collection, or had their first collection of supposed children's stories published in 1812, I think it was here in Germany, but they were translated by 1820 and were massively popular, translated into English and published in, in, the UK, in England in 1820, and were very, very popular right up until, um, and probably to this very day, we have, I don't know if you familiar with it we have a tradition in the UK which is pantomime which is a traditional children's Christmas play these are plays that got get put on at the theatre only around Christmas time and they're always based on typically on grim fairy tales so you have Cinderella you have Snow White it's a whole different world for itself it's a weird and wonderful world and one of us one of the strange British traditions that you don't really get anywhere else but they're all based on these German fairy tales and I was just uh, reflecting basically on what a presence they are and how unusual that, that seems to me now. We, obviously growing up you don't think, oh, hmm, yes, these are German folk tales or whatever. They're just, they were just ever present and just things you accepted as a child and some of them are really weird and wonderful. If I think back, um, Hansel and Gretel as we call it, Hensel und Gretel is Hansel and Gretel simply in, in English. Um, for the non-German speakers out there, Hensel and Gretel is the diminutive form of Hans and Greta. So Greta Thunberg is, uh, for some people here, Gretel, little, Gre little Greta. So we had Hansel and Gretel, 
Hänsel und Gretel, Cinderella, Aschenpüttel, Aschenbrödel, uh, Little Red Riding Hood, Rotkäppchen, The Elves and the Shoemaker, that was one of my favorites, actually, The Elves and the Shoemaker, the first tale of The Elves and the Shoemaker, uh, Rumpelstiltskin. Looking back at Rumpelstiltskin, it strikes me, he's the most stupid one. He was not the one where he says, you've got to guess my name to get out of whatever it is, and he's then dancing around a campfire saying, oh, she never guessed my name, my name is Rumpelstiltskin. I mean, no one's ever going to guess your name is Rumpelstiltskin. Andreas, Thomas, Gerd, Gerhard. And then Snow White. Those are, the pro those are the prominent ones that I remember from my childhood, the ones that are most prominent, that are told to this I'm sure they're told to this very day in schools now and isn't it weird and wonderful how in part these tales how really gruesome they are and violent and they were supposedly for children but we were all <laughs> we'll grow up just accepting these horrendous tales like um, was it Snow White where the evil queen the supposed evil queen I'll get back to that in a minute she sends out a woodcutter with the with the instruction to capture Snow White stab her to death bring her lungs and her liver back so that she can eat them. Supposedly, I've also been doing some reading around this, there's an expert, in, uh, an academic in the USA that says a lot of the violence has been taken out over the years and he's actually set about doing a, a translation himself from the originals and that also the uh, Grimm brothers didn't necessarily intend these for children and there was some kind of... Uh, dispute whether they should be allowed for children or whatever and, and in the end they they made a compromise and wrote a forward in their in their first edition of their, their tale saying this is these are moral tales but this is a, a warning that they're not necessarily suitable for children but they were simply accepted worldwide as, as children's tales children getting eaten uh, Hansel and Gretel being captured in the woods by a witch, them both being fattened up to be eaten by the witch in the end. They eventually outsmart the witch and she dies. Um, incidentally, so does the supposed stepmother, who was or originally the biological mother. This is a very interesting theme. There's very um, weird portrayal of women and there's very much a kind of support for the patriarchy. The original tale of Hansel and Gretel, it is the mother that casts them out. She there is a poor woodcutter, I think is also a woodcutter. There's famine and, and poverty are always a big influence on the Grimm tales. I think this is influenced by the fact that their father died while they were very, very young and they were also um, subject to a lot of poverty. They were very poor for a long time. So famine, poverty plays quite a lot of, of the role. It's quite often the mother that is portrayed in a very evil light. There's something to suggest that the evil witch in, in Hansel and Gretel is in fact the same character as the mother. The mother casts them out, sends them into the wood to die, basically. Horrendous tales. But there's also another this great, in, I'm wandering, wandering off a bit, uh, rambling a bit. There's this great article from The Guardian. This is about this uh, expert in the USA that set about translating the original tales again because they were supposedly watered down to take out some of the violence. And over time, the the figure of the biological mother has become a stepmother or an evil queen that's nothing to do with with anyone else the evil queen apparently in the original version of the tale was in fact snow white's biological mother it's this weird portrayal of the mother figure and and women in general and of course then you've got things like uh, rapunzel um, trapped in the tower a weird celebration of protecting unmarried women from from premarital affairs and strange things like that. It's a whole world for itself. As I say, maybe there's a video in the future that I'll do about this. But um, for now, it's just interesting for me to reflect who were the Germans that influenced me growing up as a kid. And I have to say, the Brothers Grimm, shaping the minds and lives of this, of children in the UK and all over Europe and all over the world, no doubt with some curious, gruesome moral tales. So there you go. I told you it was going to be a mixed bag. Boris Becker, Helga Schneider, and the Brothers Grimm. And I'd also like to end this video with a name that you're not going to know. Um, Marie-Louise Gregorczewski. She was my professor at university in Nottingham when I was learning German. When it comes to Germany, it all boils down to the German language for me. I wouldn't have come to Germany if I had not been studying German. It was all about my studies at first. Obviously, the love affair grew as I got to know German culture and that goes hand in hand obviously obviously with the learning of the language and Mali as we knew her I'm not sure whether she's still alive I didn't keep in contact with her at all 
but um, she would be 82 now. I looked her up. She's still in the list of uh, Germanisten, uh, German professors or whatever on the internet. I hope she's retired and enjoying um, retirement now. But uh, a German professor we had in Nottingham that very much made the language come alive for me and she was responsible for overseeing some of my favourite projects, a very important project in my final semester which gave me a distinction. We had a project we had to hold a talk, um, Vortrag it would be in, in German and we were talking about uh, divided Germany. My subject was um, the GDR from 1949 to 1961, uh, Der Bau eines sozialistischen Staates, so the, the building, the creation of a social socialist state in uh, Germany. And uh, for my spoken German, I received a distinction. It was an, something that I think they even created to recognize. It was, it was definitely new that year and it was the first time anyone was awarded it was a distinction for spoken German so along, alongside my honours degree I actually got a distinction for spoken German for that one specific project um, in recognition of my particular talents for spoken German I didn't find out until graduation day it was just next to my name and um, another professor said oh yes that's something we, we introduced this year this year to in, to recognize your uh, spoken german something that still knocks me off my feet and makes me smile as you can say so um yeah when it comes to germans that have had a direct influence on me then i'd have to say mali mali garochevsky uh, was probably just as important as boris becker helga schneider and the brothers grimm thank you very much for watching i hope this was interesting as i say I hope it did provide a few surprises. Let me know down in the comments who are the famous Germans that you most admire, who has had m most influence on your life, who are your favourite TV personalities, sports personalities, musicians, whoever, who are the most important Germans internationally in, in your experience. Really interested to hear your opinions also. At uh, this point, I'd also like to thank my patrons, the people that have signed up on Patreon to support me with a small donation every month and also get access to exclusive content. If that's something that interests you, check out the link down below. Otherwise, I will see you here as ever regularly on YouTube. Thanks very much for watching. Macht's gut, Leute!